It is finally time to look at the new gaming processor that everyone has been waiting for, the Ryzen 7 7800X3D. And according to AMD, it is supposed to be faster than the i9-3900K from Intel and almost as fast as the Ryzen 9 7950X3D from AMD, while being a lot cheaper and a lot more power efficient than both of those. So, we spent the last two weeks uh, checking the performance of this CPU in 25 different games across three different resolutions to see if these big claims that AMD made are actually true. So without further ado, let's begin. The big thing about these X3D processors is the addition of that big chunk of AMD 3D vCache. It is the same concept they used on the Ryzen 7 5800X3D from last year, and since that seemed to work out really well, they decided to do the same thing with this new generation of gaming processors. Now, the Ryzen 9 7950X3D that I reviewed a while back has a more complex design where uh, half of its cores has this 3D V cache, while the other half doesn't. And this Ryzen 7 7800X3D that is coming out tomorrow has a more straightforward design. It uses a single core complex with eight cores total, and it has a V cache available to all of those. Clock speed is a little bit lower, but the extra cache is supposed to outweigh the higher clock speeds when it comes to gaming in particular. The TDP of this chip is 120 watts, which is the same as the 16-core 7950X3D, but I will talk about the power consumption a bit later because it ended up using way less than that. Anyway, it is still a Zen 4 CPU that is built on the same 5 nanometer tech and it still uses the same AM5 socket as well as DDR5 memory like other Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. Since this is supposed to be one of the fastest gaming CPUs, I'm going to compare it to current best gaming CPUs from both AMD and Intel. So, in the graphs, uh, you will see the Ryzen 9 7950X3D as well as the i9 3900K. Now, technically, the 3900KS should be 1% or so faster than the K version, but I don't have the KS and I couldn't even buy it here in the Netherlands. I also included the 7950X in the graphs as that is the best performing non-X3D AMD CPU. As always, I try to keep the test benches as fair and as comparable as possible. And if you want to know more about the systems and the testing conditions, I will leave all the details in the description of this video and you can go ahead and check it out. So let's see how this CPU does when it comes to gaming. Starting with Spider-Man Remastered, the 7800X3D does pretty well. The benefit of the V-Cache was already clear with the Ryzen 9 7950X3D, but the 7800 shows another pretty big improvement, both in average FPS and in 1% lows, which you can see in the brackets. On 1080p and 1440p resolutions, that's enough to now really overtake the 3900K. And even at 4K, where the CPU impact is usually very small, it is about 10% faster than the 7950X3D. The Division 2 also benefits from the V-Cache, as you can see from the gap between the two Ryzen 9s, but again, the 7800 does even better. Here, the benefit is mostly visible at 1080p, with a smaller gap at 1440p and basically no gap anymore at 4K resolution. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a notoriously CPU-bound game and another one that really benefits from vCache. The 7950X3D does really well, but again, the 7800X3D does even better at 1080p, 1440p, as well as 4K, also beating Intel at every resolution. God of War has the 7800X3D beating the 7950X3D by a small margin at every resolution in average FPS, but here it is just not enough to overtake Intel. The 1% lows, on the other hand, are much better on this new chip, even beating Intel. World War Z shows a nice improvement on 1080p and 1440p with a nice draw at 4K resolution, and Assassin's Creed Valhalla doesn't seem to be that affected by the extra cache or by any CPU at all, for that matter. It is pretty much a tie across all three resolutions. Troy Total War does show a small victory for the 7800X3D over both Ryzen 9 CPUs and the i9-3900K, and especially so at lower resolutions. Far Cry 6 is probably the most extreme example of cache making a difference. 
the 7950X 3D made a huge jump from the 7950X and the i9-13900K, but the 7800X 3D did even better yet again, and then by a big margin as well, especially on 1080p and 1440p. Dying Light 2 shows little to no difference in average FPS, uh, no matter the resolution, but it does show a small bump in 1% lows. It is not a huge deal overall, but we do see more than a 10% improvement in 1% lows over the 13900K at 4K resolution, and even more at 1080p and 1440p. Shadow the Tomb Raider is getting a bit old, but it's still a nice point of reference. And here we do see a benefit from Vcache, but there is very little difference between the 7800X3D and the 7950X3D, which is again good news for the new chip because it is much cheaper than the gaming Ryzen 9. Wolfenstein Youngblood has the 7800X3D looking excellent once again, beating all other processors, especially at lower resolutions. And Cyberpunk 2077, on the other hand, is the first game that actually has the 7800X3D behind its bigger brother by a little bit, or at least on 1080p and 1440p. The differences are small enough that it doesn't really matter, but it is good to see that the 7800X3D isn't just outright faster in everything. Thing. Like in Watch Dogs Legion, for example, where it yet again overtakes all others at 1080p and 1440p and matches the 7950X3D at 4K resolution while being far ahead of Intel overall. In Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the 7800X3D really pulls ahead of both Ryzen 9s and gets just ahead of Intel on 1080p, but the i9 does retain the lead on 1440p and 4K resolutions. In Borderlands 3, the 7800X3D is ahead of the i9 on all three resolutions, even though the margin is quite small, and it is pretty much tied with the 7950X3D overall. It manages to make a pretty big jump in Doom Eternal as well, especially on 1080p. Now Intel gets to keep its lead in this game, but again, differences are pretty small and mostly in average FPS, not in the 1% lows. Dirt 5 is another win for AMD, with the 7800X3D just beating the Ryzen 9s, as well as the i9, on 1080p and 1440p. On 4K resolution, it is basically a tie. Formula 1 2022 ends up a tie on both 4K and 1440p resolutions, with the 7800X3D taking a small but practically not that relevant win at 1080p. CSGO is more frequency bound and not that cache sensitive, so it's not really a surprise that the 7800X3D is a bit behind compared to others, especially at lower resolutions. It is not that relevant with these sort of FPS numbers, but other processors in this list did technically perform better. Rainbow Six Siege is another esports game, and this one does seem to respond to both cache and frequency. So the 7800X3D is behind the Ryzen 9 7950X3D, but it is still comfortably ahead of the i9 on all three resolutions, even though it doesn't really matter with these numbers. In Outriders, the 7800X3D is beaten by the 7950X3D by a tiny bit, but it does beat Intel at 1080p and 1440p before it becomes another tie at 4K resolution. When it comes to average FPS in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, there isn't much of a difference, but it does show considerably better 1% lows, especially compared to the i9-3900K. Gotham Knights had a lot of updates so far, but the performance is still pretty inconsistent in this game. Uh, still, the 7800X3D roughly ties with the 7950X3D and the i9-3900K. Red Dead Redemption 2 showed promise on 1080p, where the 7800X3D beat all others nicely, but at 1440p and 4K it makes very little difference, and it ended up just behind the 7950X3D. And finally, Anno 1800. Now this is a game that really does favor AMD over Intel, but as you can see, it showed very little difference between all these AMD CPUs in the graph. So if I compare the 7800X3D to the 7950X3D on 1080p resolution, the new Ryzen 7 looks great. AMD claimed that the Ryzen 7 should be almost as good as the Ryzen 9, but based on the 25 games that I've tested for this video, it is ahead of the Ryzen 9 by about 
4% on average. Now that is not a huge margin and in majority of games the difference is pretty irrelevant, but it is still faster on average with gains of 10% or more in 4 games and only a single loss of 5%. On 1440p, the gap is only 2%, which is basically irrelevant, even if there are three games that do have the 7800X 3D ahead by 9 to 12%. But it is still a small win, rather than a small loss, that I would have expected. Even at 4K resolution, the 7800X 3D ends up on top, with still a couple of games showing a gap of 5% or more. Again, it is not a huge difference, but it is technically faster. Now, AMD said that the Ryzen 9 should be the best CPU overall when it comes to gaming, as it has one core complex with vCache and another one with higher clock speeds, and then games would be steered towards using whichever is best for a particular title. But after seeing these 25 games, it just seems like the simpler design of the 7800X 3D ends up being faster more often than not, or at least for now. I'm not sure if that will change when new games come out. Uh, more importantly, the 7800X 3D also beats the 3900K. On 1080p, it is actually ahead by more than 9%. Intel does hold on to somewhat significant wins in CSGO and Cyberpunk 2077, but AMD counters that with a couple of games that show even bigger differences the other way around. Far Cry 6's 43% difference is exceptional, but uh, we're seeing wins of 20% or more in several other games like Anno, Watch Dogs Legion, Rainbow Six Siege, Dirt 5, and Microsoft Flight Simulator. Even on 1440p, there is a 6% lead on average. Now, Intel has a lead of 5% or more in two games, but the 7800X 3D wins 11. On 4K resolution, uh, where the 7950X 3D ended up a fraction of percent behind the i9, the 7800X 3D is now ahead. The 3900K wins 3 games by 5% or more, while the 7800X 3D wins 5 games. In most games, it is so close that it doesn't really matter, but it is still a win for AMD. So when it comes to gaming, uh, this processor does extremely well. But let's see how it performs when it comes to regular CPU workloads. In Cinebench R23, the 7800X 3D clearly lags the cores to compete with other CPUs. The 7950X 3D scores about double, and the i9-3900K is ahead even more. In a single-threaded application, the 7800X 3D is also behind a bit. The 7950X 3D is 13% faster, and the i9-3900K is about 19% faster. In a quick Blender run, the 7800X 3D ends up taking a bit over twice as long to do the same task. Uh, it is not a bad result. I mean, it is still faster than the 11900K, for example, which is only two years old. So if you're coming from something a bit older, it is still a very capable work CPU. But even an i5-13600K will be faster at jobs that scale nicely with more cores, more threads, and clock speeds, rather than more cache. And I think it is definitely more than fine if you do some lighter workloads or do some occasional editing here and there, but if you really need a lot of CPU power, uh, there are just better options out there, and the 7800X 3D really makes more sense if most of what you do is game. But where it really gets interesting is the power draw. So technically, the 7800X 3D and the 7950X 3D have the same 120 watt TDP. But the actual power consumption is very different. The Ryzen 9 ended up using about 144 watts when set to work, while the 7800X 3D rarely went above 90 watts. The 7950X 3D does complete this longer benchmark in about half the time, so the Ryzen 9 is far more efficient, especially if you factor in the total power use of all your parts during that shorter time period. But the i9-13900K takes more than three times the power to do the job twice as fast, which makes the 7800X 3D pretty good if you value efficiency. 
Also, since it rarely uses more than 90 watts in anything I've seen so far, the 7800X3D is extremely easy to keep cool. I had it under a big all-in-one cooler, but it never reached 70 degrees, uh, even after hours of stress testing. So you will be completely fine, even with a simple budget tower cooler, while the i9 and even the i7 really require a big water cooler or a high-end air cooler at the very least. And then you can use the price difference towards a better graphics card, for example. More relevant for a gaming CPU is the power it uses while gaming. Now I'm using Cyberpunk 2077 for this example, and as you know, at 4K resolution, it is a very GPU bound game. Still, the difference in power the CPU uses uh, to put out the same number of frames is huge. It was using less than half of the power of the i9-3900K to hit the same 92 FPS mark. 65 watts is also almost half the power of the older 7950X, and it is 20 watts or about 25% less than the 7950X3D. And it is the same story on 1080p, where the i9-3900K ends up using almost two and a half times the power of the 7800X3D for marginally better performance in this particular title. Most people won't really notice these differences in their energy bills and wallets, but if electricity costs a lot in your region, like it does in Europe, for example, and if you're someone that spends a lot of hours gaming every single day, it is definitely worth uh, making a little calculation of how much the difference will mean to you. Unfortunately, idle power still seems to be an issue for AMD and not just for the XGD CPUs. Uh, Intel manages to reduce power draw a lot more in idle and very light use. So depending on your exact use case and your power rates, you could still make a case for Intel's efficiency. If you have your system just on and idling a lot, uh, let's say about uh, four to six times as long as you actually spend gaming, it will kind of break even. So at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to gaming, the 7800X3D comes out really strong. On average, it manages to beat the 7950X3D and the i9-3900K on all three resolutions. Uh, it is also much cheaper, and since it is more power efficient, it means that you can save even more money on a cheaper motherboard, uh, you can save more money on a cheaper cooler, and depending on your use case and energy prices in your region, you can also save some money on your power bill. And I really found myself stretching to see the big downsides. And then for every downside, there was a good counter argument that follows it. So $450 isn't exactly a budget CPU, and you can absolutely argue that you can get a good gaming CPU for $200 to $250-ish dollars or even less. But on the other hand, this beats the best, most expensive CPUs on the market for a lot less money. It is also not a real productivity CPU, but it is still more than powerful enough for most things that people do next to gaming. And I guess you could worry about eight cores maybe um, not being enough to be the 16 core CPU someday in some game, but seeing that this CPU beats the 7950X3D in uh, Flight Simulator, which is the most CPU bottleneck game right now, I really doubt it will struggle with any game anytime soon. And if it does, AMD promised to support this AM5 socket for the next few years, so you could just replace the CPU and keep everything else, which is not something you can say for Intel. The only Intel argument is that if you spend even more money on a highly optimized memory kit and then spend a lot of time tuning it, you might be able to close that gap by a bit, but uh, then you're spending even more money on an already more expensive product. So in my opinion, if you mostly care about gaming and gaming performance, the 7800X3D is the most logical choice, even if your budget allows for more. Uh, you might as well just get a better graphics card or actually anything else for that matter. And that brings me to the last issue that might happen, availability. The 7950X3D has been constantly sold out since the launch, and seeing how this one performs, I would expect the first waves of CPUs to go really quickly. So yeah, 
it doesn't matter how good it is if you cannot buy it. And I really hope that AMD can get this under control because right now, this Ryzen 7 7800X3D is the new king of gaming CPUs. This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their brand new Vertex power supplies. These fully modular power supplies are extremely efficient and very quiet due to their fan design and their hybrid fan mode that stops the fans completely under 40% load. They come with a variety of connections for any kind of systems you have in mind, including the new 12 volt high power cable for the latest RTX graphics cards. And as a little bonus, you get a cozy 10 year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. And that is where I will leave it for today. I hope you enjoyed this review. Uh, don't forget to press that subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this one, because there might be some interesting GPU content coming up soon, perhaps. Thank you all for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.